All right, well, um, thanks everyone for coming to this uh, discussion today. Uh, my name is Amy Hall and I'm a co-editor at New Internationalist magazine. Um, we're really excited to have so many of you joining us today from around the world to discuss air pollution and what we can do about it. Um, and do feel free, free to put a message in the chat and say hi and where you're based. So we kind of get a bit of an idea of where everyone's at. Um, before we start, I just wanted to say that this webinar is being recorded so and we'll send a recording to everyone who registered, but just to make sure that you know that. Um, so the current edition of New Internationalist takes air pollution as its focus um, and putting this magazine together it's been one of the issues that I found um, scarier and scarier the more I research it. Um, it's something that affects all of us everywhere and can have such an impact on every part of the body and it's got me thinking about the impact that it could have already had on my own health um, the people close to me who've experienced things like strokes and heart disease and dementia and air pollution is one of the world's sing is the world's single largest environmental health risk, according to the World Health Organization, um, and leads to seven million deaths each year around the world. It's also an issue of inequality, affecting the youngest, oldest, sickest, and the poorest the most. And it's also an issue of racial justice, as ethnic minorities often live in some of the most polluted areas. Air pollution has many causes, often related to human activity, but if we could just reduce air pollution, um, we could also help combat climate change and save millions of lives in the process. There are, of course, many people around the world who have been working tirelessly to try and make this happen, including some of the members of our panel, but um, we've still got a long way to go. And right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, the impact of which has been linked to air pollution. Um, and COVID-19 also affects uh, the most vulnerable people the most, as well as air pollution. So they're, they're kind of linked. Sorry, I didn't say that very well. Um, the people most at risk of COVID-19 are also more vulnerable to air pollution. Uh, meanwhile, the cleaner air has been one of the more enjoyable parts of the COVID-19 restrictions. And people with asthma and lung disease have reported improvements in their symptoms. But is it looking like we're just heading straight back to our polluted normal? That's one of the things that uh, we're going to discuss today. Before we go to our speakers, I wanted to give a little mention to a community journalism project that we've been doing as part of this Air Pollution magazine. Um, we held workshops with campaigners and people concerned about air pollution in the northeast of England. And you can see some of their great work in our current edition. And some of the people from that project are uh, joining this webinar today. So hi to you. Um, if you have any questions throughout this event, then please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, my colleague, Laura, will be keeping an eye out for them. And um, at the end of the webinar, we would be really, really grateful if you could help us by filling in a short survey um, about what did and didn't work for you as part of this event. Um, we have some free magazine subscriptions to try and tempt you to do that as well. Um, but we'll post more information about that later and let you know you should also get an email about it. So to our panel, and we're really lucky to have such inspiring people to speak to today. Um, and we'll have time for questions um, a little bit later on. So we're going to start with hearing uh, more about them and their work. They're going to do a little introduction. So first up, we have Dr. Gary Fuller, who is an air pollution scientist at King's College London and Pollution Watch columnist for The Guardian newspaper. He is also the author of the book, The Invisible Killer, The Rising Threat of Global the rising global threat of air pollution and how we can fight back. This is my copy with all the notes that I've been making in it. Um, it's published by Melville House UK um, and it's a great read for anyone who wants to learn more about air pollution and some of the issues that we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to hand over to Gary and uh, we can hear more from him. Hi Amy, hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me uh, along this evening um, to talk about uh, this topic. Um, a little, little bit about me, I, I'm a scientist and uh, I, along with a large team at King's College London, have been measuring air pollution in the capital now for uh, almost 30 years. And during this time, we've seen a great deal of changes 
Um, changes that we've seen have been the reduction of coal burning uh, air pollution that's come into the city from power stations in the area around us. Um, we've also seen the arrival of diesel cars on our roads and of course the Dieselgate VW issues. And we've seen some very large interventions in London as well. And my team and I have been tracking how well they're working. So these are things that have tried to do something about London's air pollution to combat it. These have been things to improve the exhaust emissions from buses and other schemes such as London's ultra low emission zone, uh, which is actually being very effective for uh, the central area. Um, we treat London very much as when people come to visit us at King's they often ask to see our laboratories and we don't really have that much in terms of shiny laboratories and equipment because everything for us is out there in the field. We're interested really in studying the whole way that London and our city and the area around it functions as a system and functions in terms of the way that air pollution is emitted from sources, the way that then creates concentrations, the way that people are exposed to it, and then finally the effects that it has on our health. And it's only really through tracking this process that we're able to understand not only what the major problems are, about how to tackle them and then an area where I don't think enough work is being done really is whether the things that we are doing to tackle them are actually proving effective. Okay thanks Gary, uh, I'm just gonna move the video. Okay so um, next up we have Rosamond. Um, Rosamond Kissy Deborah is the co-founder of the Ella Roberta Family Foundation, which she started with Dr. Colin Wallace, a respiratory consultant at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. The foundation was set up after the death of Rosamond's daughter Ella in 2013 from a rare and severe form of asthma. Rosamond works to try and raise awareness about air pollution and asthma, particularly for children in southeast London and she has been fighting to get air pollution recognised as a cause of Ella's death in a legal landmark case that could set an important precedent, precedent in recognising how air pollution impacts on people's health. Last year, Rosamond was appointed as the first advocate at the World Health Organisation for Health and Air Quality, um, and I'm really, really happy that she's been able to come and speak to us today. Um, Rosamond, over to you. Hello, can, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Right, one yes, second. we can hear you. You can hear me. Oh, hello. Um, I am the um, chair the, of the, and the executive, the director of the Hello Roberta Foundation. And I actually came into this by chance. My background is I'm a qualified teacher in psychology and philosophy. So that might give a clue as to why I... I like reading a lot of research because I actually used to teach young um, A-level students um, how to write research. Um, I think I wanted to find an understanding of why my late daughter had become so ill and so suddenly. And this led me into the world of hair pollution. And I think what I would say is, we talk about COVID-19 being a pandemic, but I would actually argue that air pollution in itself is a pandemic because every year it kills 7 million people all over the world. And what I used to struggle with, um, when I used to talk about clean air, I didn't think a lot of people had an understanding or an experience of clean air. And sadly, with COVID-19 happening, now I feel everyone everywhere knows what clean air is and what it feels like. So hopefully this conversation this evening will remind people again what is clean air and why clean air is so important for our survival. And thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot, Rosamond. So next up, 
um, we have Aruna Chandrash Chandrasekhar, who is an independent environmental journalist from India, currently based in the UK at the University of Oxford's Environmental Change Institute. Her work covers corporate accountability, climate change, indigenous rights, conflict, gender and public health. And you can read her excellent article on air pollution and resistance in Mumbai in our current edition. Um, and it was also published on our website today. So if you go to newint.org, you'll be able to see it. So Aruna, thanks for coming. And I'm going to hand over to you now. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, um, Amy, and the New Internationalist. Um, it's been um, amazing uh, writing for you, especially on an issue that's extremely close to my heart. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Aruna. I'm a, a journalist. I do a bit of research. Um, I have um, very poor lungs um, and um, was always known as a snotty-nosed kid. Um, and lived in Bangalore in India, but also moved, uh, I tried living in Delhi as a sort of um, immersive or embedded journalism exercise in understanding what it is uh, to live in one of the most polluted parts of the country, but also because uh, my work in this area was guided by um, a, a need to try and understand what it is that, where do we get our power from? Uh, where does India get its water from? Um, where are these mineral-based and heavy industrial areas uh, where people live and how do they live? Um, and so a lot of my work has been based uh, looking at coal and energy and climate change. And uh, in the years that I spent on the road, uh, traveling to different mining districts and places where there were extremely large power plants, I think, uh, one of the things that always uh, struck me was how uh, the focus has always been so Delhi-centric or um, very city-centric when we discuss and when we talk about air pollution. And in a way, that's a good thing because then we realize that, that these are not isolated problems, that you can join the dots between what's happening in the city and the countryside. Um, but also, it's a talking point of who shoulders a pollution burden. Uh, and also that these are these are ways that communities are using to kind of uh, resist and mobilize. Now, city dwellers can also build those links. And uh, public health is definitely something that uh, that that affects and that can unite us all, especially in this fight uh, towards clearer skies and cleaner cities and uh, cleaner countrysides. But, but more importantly, also against environmental racism and so that we can examine our footprint on the planet. Thanks, Aruna. Um, so, so we're here partly to discuss um, what we can do about some of the issues around air pollution today. Um, so it would be really great to hear from you all about um, some of the changes that you've been part of or some of the changes that you've seen happening. Um, and I'm going to start with Rosamond, if that's all right. Yes, that's fine. Um, when you say changes, what are you referring to? So anything, any kind of positive, I guess, developments you've seen happen when it comes to air pollution? So, well, the major the positive trying to push for. Well, the major positive will be that more pollution, um, sorry, more people are aware of air pollution now. There is no doubt about that. It is in the public consciousness. Um, and also the fact that there is legislation going through Parliament now that's all positive but the changes as far as i'm concerned they're not radical enough and they're not quick enough um i think there is a lot more to do about raising awareness and linking air pollution to health and people truly understanding about the impact on the on people's health you, you know we've had all for the last 10 to 12 weeks talking about the virus um, the word underlining health conditions has come up quite a lot and hopefully what people will will find out after this is how much of that is linked to air pollution so I've spoken about it before and if you don't mind to mention it again, sort of heart attacks, asthma attacks, dementia, cognitive 
development, all these main illnesses, they are all linked to air pollution. And I think it's something that people were not really aware of. So there is much more work to do about raising awareness. Um, so I am encouraged from where I started off six years ago now compared to now, at least every fortnight, I, I would say, there is a mention of air pollution in the national news, but there is much more work that still needs to be done. Thanks a lot, Rosamond. And yeah, we'll, we'll hear from you more again in a bit. Um, Aruna, um, same question to you. Um, what, what kinds of things have you seen happen to change the situation when it comes to air? I think it's interesting because there has been a much greater push from urban centers where people are closer to power uh, and to be able to push for certain uh, projects to be halted. For instance, when we were talking about the city of Mumbai, where, which is also there in this magazine's issue, where a community that was pushed out from around the city's pipelines were relocated, dumped in these tower blocks, where there's no sunlight, salute, and surrounded by oil refineries and smokestacks. These people organized um, and managed to secure rehabilitation, fight cases, um, of course, ambulance in the background, uh, a reminder that this is a respiratory pandemic. Um, the changes that we are seeing right now are essentially that, like you have people in urban centers and communities fighting back taking on cases. There was a landmark case uh, last month in which uh, a community in India's coal belt had for the first time held the coal industry accountable for uh, violations and health violations and looking at air pollution. And they had commissioned the studies themselves, fought to a large extent and argued the cases themselves. This was done via video conferencing even before COVID hit, uh, where you know where courts had been shut down in these industrial districts. But um, and justice seems to have moved further and further away from people. But the the assertion um, is stronger. And then now you you see. Uh, Alliances sort of being built between uh, people in cities versus uh, people in the hinterland and who um, are fighting against uh, looking at emissions by various different sectors of industry. So that's powerful in terms of that there have been wins and there is greater public awareness and mobilization. I think I was at um, the 2016-2017 COP when Arnold Schwarzenegger criticized the environmental community saying, I mean, why we can say hassle la vista fossil fuels, I think a way to, to get people to care about what's happening on climate change is to, to talk about very lived experience, which is, and very localized, um, looking at air pollution. Um, and since then, we've also seen that focus uh, really picking up, especially in terms of health and in terms of uh, people being much more aware of what they, they live around. But um, I do see the opposite also happening in which the lockdown is being used um, as a way to crack down on environmental activists in many different parts of the world. And I see this in India as well. Um, but and it's being used as an excuse to weaken laws, whether it's uh, pollution control or whether it's environmental impact assessment laws and uh, changes around it, or whether it is industry is being able to push through. So communities I've spoken to in mining zones um, have told me that it's easier for more pollution to take place now that there's no one to to check or regulate um, and that people who are resisting are not able to because that there are preventive laws that prevent them from coming out and mobilizing so in a way i mean there are wins and there are there there are uh, extremely uh, disturbing things which are getting passed uh, under the cover of a lockdown um, and when it is actually an opportunity for us to make the kind of transition that we need. And I think it's important to also consider, for instance, like looking at COVID in this situation um, where power demand has gone down by nearly 30%, then why would you want to expand more 
uh, coal-fired electricity kind of does highlight the fact that you would want to go and make a transition to less polluting sources that actually don't require as much transport, uh, that don't require uh, you to have to deal with uh, looking at people crossing or, or mine workers or looking at um, how do you enforce safety inside an underground mine. So these are many of the complaints that, that communities uh, seem to have. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's an important time for us to also consider what is the kind of uh, footprint, uh, how livable do we want to make our cities, um, what can we deal with and what can't we. Like the city of Delhi had an odd even um, uh, plan to kind of help transition uh, or re reduce pollution load during winter months. But now we're seeing, and that was difficult to implement because people had issues and problems. But um, with restricting themselves to one SUV. Uh, but uh, so I think there are, but now that everyone's at home and uh, we've kind of been used to this, what is an acceptable level of uh, personal comfort versus uh, respiratory discomfort that we are willing to accept? And can we look at deeper systemic issues? For instance, uh, the displacement cost of mining or looking at what the agricultural sector faces. For instance, like the city of Delhi gets a lot of uh, stubble burning, as they call it, um, almost, uh, yeah, so in terms of agricultural residue. But it requires us to fix an entire form of farming, which takes a lot longer. And it's not something that can be done overnight by imposing fines on farmers, you know, penalizing them for processes that take really long to put in place. Um, and how do you make those transitions? So it's, it, these are changes and systemic changes that we do actually have time to deliberate on. And the question is if governments will take that high road or will they continue around a path uh, that seems to be more disturbing the world over? Thanks a lot, Aruna. Um, Gary, it'd be great to hear a bit from you about some of the changes that you've seen happen um, or that you've been part of. Oops. It's all good. You're, Sorry, you're can you hear me? A lot of yes. things have appeared on yeah. my screen all at the same time. Um, yeah, picking up on some of the things that Aruna uh, and Rosamond have said, one of the things that's happened over the last few decades with air pollution is a huge growth in, in what we know. We learned in, the, in 1952 with London smogs that really short-term episodes of air pollution were harmful to people's health. And so we sought to try to tackle them. We learned from the science of the 1990s that we shouldn't just be concerned about smog episodes, but we should be concerned about the exposure to air pollution that people have every day through their lives. And you have to pay tribute here to the scientists that did the famous Six Cities study. What they did was they followed a group of several thousand people uh, for about 14 years. And uh, each year, this was before the days of the internet, they wrote to them and sent them a postcard and said, are you dead yet? And if the people didn't reply, they sent out a researcher to investigate. And what they found was that people that were living in more polluted places were dying sooner. And they weren't just dying of, you know, respiratory diseases, they were dying of stroke, heart attacks, and all the things that people normally die of but the air pollution they were experiencing was shortening their lives. So that means we just have to not manage just the smogs, but we have to manage the everyday exposure. I think the latest area of science uh, which we should really be taking on board is around life course um, exposure. So what the latest parts of science are saying is that the air pollution that our children are experiencing today may be giving them some sort of lifelong impairment going forward. And that really changes the way in which we should prioritize tackling air pollution, not just as an issue for now, but as an issue for the future, as an investment in our future. So for instance, we did a study in um, across North and East London, uh, well, my colleagues mostly, um, whereby we looked at um, air pollution in, in school children, in primary school children. And what we found was those that were living in the most polluted area were 
growing smaller lungs. And this difference in lung growth is probably about the volume of two hen's eggs. And the kids would not notice this themselves unless they want to be a top-rate athlete. But if you think about your family or, the, or your grandparents or the older people in your family and the ends of their lives, very much old age is characterized by a fight for breath when people get influenza and things like that. So if we're storing up this legacy from the exposure of our children today to air from air pollution, will this, and it's an open question, will this actually be store up a legacy of ill health going forward? So that changes the way in which we should tackle this and the priority we should give it. I think as um, Aruna and Rosman said, people's awareness of air pollution has changed a great deal. Air pollution is in the media. I see a story every couple of days in uh, national newspapers, and you see many international stories as well. And I think that's really good. And the narratives there are changing a great deal. They're changing from just pointing out one problem to the next to starting to join that all together. But that is still something that's missing. People read these stories about air pollution and issues, but I think it's very hard from the media to try to draw it all together into one narrative that challenges it towards action, really. Um, but which is one of the reasons, actually, I, I wrote the book that uh, Amy was um, kindly waving before, was to draw, try to draw this all together into one sort of understandable uh, narrative and one direction for action. But saying that, I mean, I'm heartened by the amount of people that get in contact with us um, at London Air and, and at King's and the people that are viewing our web pages. We get a couple of hundred thousand visitors uh, per year. <clears throat> and the people that are using the tools we provide to help them think about moving around the city such that they're exposed to less air pollution. But having said this, there are areas where there is still greater awareness of air pollution required, and that's with our policy makers. There was a time when, I don't know if Murad Qureshi is one of the people on this uh, call, but he was a London uh, Assembly member. And uh, I was called to give ev evidence before the uh, London Assembly. And the first question they asked was, when will we have enough scientific evidence to justify tackling air pollution? And I was aghast. I was just absolutely flabbergasted. You know, I could take go over to the bookshelves and pull out thousands of peer-reviewed papers that indicate the harm from air pollution we already have too much evidence telling us that we should be tackling air pollution but yet this doesn't translate into the action at a political level and at a mass level across society and that's the part that still uh, missing at the moment. And if I look at the work that we've done at King's over the years, yes, we've made, you know, we've developed Europe's most sophisticated air pollution measurement system. We've produced a huge number of scientific papers. But I think one of the things that we should be most proud of is the way that all of us from Frank, who's our director, and many other people have gone out there and tried to communicate this in the media try to um, appear before uh, committees of inquiry and so forth to try to put the narrative together and to put the evidence out there in a clear way. We're not alone in this. A lot of people from the scientific community are increasingly uh, speaking up in this arena, but that's what's required. It's for that to be heard and for that then to be translated into action going forward. Thanks a lot, Gary. So um, next, um, I was thinking it'd be really good to be able to look to the future. Um, what do you think needs to happen to deal with air pollution? Um, are there any opportunities or barriers you can see coming up in the following months and years? Um, and I guess particularly in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, which we've um, already talked about a little bit. Um, Aruna, I was wondering if um, I could start with you. Um, over to you. Um, so yeah, I mean, the pandemic is a portal, everyone loves seeing it, uh, but I 
agree with Gary, especially on um, our obsession sometimes with measurement and what is described as measurementality, uh, where we have sometimes so much information. And I think the drive and a lot of the focus has been on getting air quality readings, uh, where you can tweet hashtag breathe, um, where, of course, whether siren going off or otherwise, um, you're going to get your reading of just how bad it is. And more likely that will happen if you are in a city where there are as many monitors. So Delhi might have 30 plus monitors in with uh, that are looking at air in different parts of the city. But where are these monitors located? Um, are they in places where politicians want us to look? or don't want us to look. So I think in terms of rather than, uh, and a lot of funding also seems to be going towards setting up more and more monitoring, but I think there's enough and more studies to tell us that things are pretty bad. Um, and we don't need to be the, this is fine, Jif. I think all of us know that and see that in, um, in our cities where we live. Um, I think th what matters is where we measure, um, what we measure and if there's political will around it. You can have as many different readings, but if you're not going to reduce polluting infrastructure or conduct a cumulative impact assessment of A, if it's an industrial district, how much can it actually sustain um, of more own or different localities have their own air pollution problems. This is something that we realized while doing a project called Breathless. So me and a photographer friend Ishan Tangha, we traveled across India to different cities and locations to try and to point out and do photo essays and do an art exhibit uh, which looks at different places and what are the peculiar problems around it, whether it's transport or whether it's, if it's a new city, you have much more construction. Different neighborhoods have their own issues. So I think uh, one of the things that we do need to look towards the future is in terms of uh, these cumulative impact assessments of how much of a pollution load can a place take and are political forces willing to take the decisions to act accordingly. Uh, and I think in that, rather than just doing blind more deployment of monitors and as a basic ch checklist for each policymaker to tick off to say that I did this or I accomplished this in a four-year cycle, I think uh, uh, that's something that I really hope to see in the future. And also, like, how are we going to restructure um, our cities as well as consumption? Are we going to go back um, to the same level? I don't think so. And especially with um, large amounts of uh, labor exodus that has seen the worst uh, effects and impacts, not only are they dealing with the fallout of pollution in the worst way, but they're also suffering because of a lockdown and unemployment. But you can see industry is also taking a hit. Now, how do we choose what kind of industry, what kind of uh, just transition that we want uh, to bring forward and I think it's the perfect time for us to be able to articulate what that is um, and for cities to be able to assume some of those or for regions to be able to to set up their own climate change action plans or equality plans um, and to to put that forward because we do know that we have a problem now where do we go from here and if if those are visions that we don't draft ourselves uh, and put our creative imagination to, then we uh, lose a, mo a moment to in time to uh, really push for a stronger movement for cleaner. Thanks a lot, Aruna. So, um, Gary, over to you. What do you think is coming up uh, that we need to be looking out for? Um, I'm not sure things that are coming up that we're looking out for. I mean, that that's, that's just huge. The whole world is just, everything's open to change. But before I say those, one, one thing I, I think what Aruna says is just really spot on. Um, but I will put in the caveat that we need to understand the problem before we can tackle it. But we need to make sure we're also investing our effort in tackling. We're measuring to tackle the problem, to understand it, not just measuring for measurement's sake. But Aruna, you said something that's really interesting. How much air pollution can a place take? And 
I think this really goes to the heart of something going forward about the way we need to be changing our thinking. We think about air pollution in terms of legal limits, the WHO has its guidelines and so forth, but the way the science is changing is that it's telling us that, for instance, for PM 2.5, there's a lot of debate about this in the UK and what limits we should have. But there are plenty of studies that are telling us that we're still seeing health impacts even in places that are meeting the World Health Organization guidelines. So you raised the question, Aruna, of how much air pollution should a place take? And I, I think this is in some ways, our regulators also say this as well. They regard the limits that we have not as something to move things down to, but in many places they regard it as a ceiling to pollute up to. And we need to change that way of thinking. We need to be ensuring going forward that we're bringing down air pollution, not just in the places that we measure, and you know, not just in the centre of cities or next to roads. We're bringing down air pollution everywhere, and we're making that happen for all communities. And that's a real problem. So even in the you know in the UK, if you look at air pollution since the turn of the millennium and the change that has happened. There's a very nice study by University of the West of England that says that there have been improvements, but these improvements are mostly seen in the areas where the wealthier people live rather than where uh, people live in, you know, less, less good circumstances. And we need to ensure that air pollution improves for everyone. Um, I think looking also to the future, um, you'll have noticed the cast on my arm. Um, somewhere at the start of the uh, lockdown, my morning bike ride was rudely interrupted by a car. And um, it's kind of, yeah, I've had quite a, uh, some weeks where I haven't really been able to do very much. But some of the things I have enjoyed and noticed so much about the lockdown is the change in the sound around us. The city where I live is gone very quiet and also in blue skies as well. And throughout the history of air pollution, people have looked up towards the skies and they've seen times when they are blue. If we look at Beijing, when they've imposed uh, a huge number of changes on industry and traffic around the city for certain events such as the Olympics and some of the summits that they've had there and the events to um, mark the ending of the Second World War, there was huge changes in the city's air pollution and the people could see manifestly blue skies around them. There's been some fantastic pictures in the media of the Himalayas now visible from parts of northern India where people have just seen haze in the distance before and to see that there was mountains over there is something just that their grandparents and elderly people talk about but now everybody is seeing it so the COVID and our response to it in terms of the way that we've changed so much in society, it's just shown people the air pollution around them and made it visible, if you like, not just here, but as I say, across the world, people have noticed this. And if anything, what it's actually told us as well is that change is possible. Often politicians put up barriers to change or businesses put up barriers to change. But what we've done in around the world in response to this epidemic shows us what can be done and that with sufficient will and energy, change is possible. For instance, in London, nitrogen dioxide that we think is, you know, pretty much an intractable problem in the city that's plagued us for some decades has dropped by around 30 odd percent alongside the major votes. And that, that's, that's, that's really quite an achievement. Um, also, what we've also seen in terms of air pollution in the UK and certainly in southern England is, despite the fact that there's been a lot less transport on the road, not all air pollutants have improved. So PM 2.5 particles has been worse during the lockdown period than it was in the, since January um, until the end of March. And you say, well, why is that? Well, that's telling us that there is lots of other air pollution sources that aren't just transport. So key amongst these are things like agriculture, 
um, that was mentioned uh, before. So the story of the lockdown, the blue skies, and also the ways in which we have go, go forward is that we have to stop mapping air pollution in terms of just one single source or one single problem and move on to being able to tackle this in a holistic way so that all communities and everybody that is exposed get something that is better. And that brings us to the agenda going forward. We've heard a lot about Build Back Better, and I'm not quite sure where that came from. I think it was like a UN Maxim or a WHO one. But we have to think about how we can move forward from this times in a way that's better. And we have also climate change as a massive challenge uh, before us. So we need to make sure that the decisions we take moving forward are the ones that bring together all of these agendas. So they bring together our health, they bring together our environmental impacts, and we make the right decisions for air pollution and climate change. And our history on this has not been good in terms of ensuring that these two agenda um, run together. So I think, you know, looking forward, there will be tremendous pressure to go back to what we've had before. But equally, there is tremendous opportunity to use this as a time to go forward to something different. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, Rosamond, what are your thoughts on the future of um, what we can do about air pollution and things that are coming up? The future does make me nervous um, because it's about, I sometimes think, what's in a life? Because when I look at how the government and ultimately we as individuals, we can do our bits, but ultimately it's about government and what government does. And the way they've treated the pandemic or dealt with it does make me incredibly nervous going forward. And I think mo most people who, who might have logged on may know the, they have already rejected the WHO targets for PM 2.5 going forward. So that's something that I am incredibly worried about. That tells me how they are thinking. Um, and also, I think what I was really shocked about is just, I knew the air was dirty, but I didn't really realize just how much. And at one stage, transport was down by 90%. And I know going forward with the economy opening, that's not going to be possible. But I'm wondering what is the trade-off really? I know they're going to bombard us with messages about the economy and things like that. But I don't want people to forget that unless we clean up the air, the actual things aren't going to get any better. We are going to continue to get ill for a start. And I think there's this battle between clean air and the economy. Why can't it be um, both? We are going to have to change the way we do things. We now know that. Not everyone can work from home, but we know that a significant amount of people can work from home. We know, looking at other countries, and I'm comparing it to the UK, other countries have been a bit more forward with uh, bicycle lanes and things like that. I am not surprised ever that the UK, especially in teenagers between 13 and 16, we have the worst asthma deaths in those ages. And this is not acceptable. So there does need to be, I think we as the public need to push the government. And we have realized over the past week or two, when, when you demand things from the government, they will start to actually do things. I, I sometimes worry that we are far too passive and we just accept things. And I think we need to demand more because it is not acceptable that 40,000, there are 40,000 premature deaths every year in this country. And I think we need to demand more from the government rather than just accept things. Thanks. 
Thanks, Rosamond. I am all for that. Let's demand more for sure. Um, okay, so we've been having people ask some questions and we're about ready to go over to them. Um, so just to Gary, Aruna and Rosamond, don't feel that you have to answer every question, but I will give you the opportunity to, but you can pass, that's fine. Um, so the first question um, that we have is from Eleanor. Um, and um, we've seen the connections being made between um, air pollution and health inequalities during um, COVID-19. Uh, and she says, for me, this raised the question of whether there could be similar potential role played by air pollution in the huge health inequalities in maternity in the UK. Um, and I think that's partly in relation to the massive disparity that we have in the UK in terms of race and, and, matern and maternal health. Um, and the connections that have also been made with kind of areas where um, there's higher air pollution and higher rates of um, COVID-19 deaths uh, among certain ethnic minorities in the UK. Um, and I'm actually going to ask another question at the same time because it's kind of related, um, which is from Penny. Um, taking up Gary's point about there being a substantial body of evidence detailing the harm that poor air quality does to health, why aren't we prioritising children's health more? So that's a question about inequality, um, uh, maternal health, children's health. Um, and um, Gary, I'm going to come to you first and see if you would like to say anything. OK. Um, there, there are huge uh, inequalities in terms of the air pollution we're exposed to um, within the UK. And certainly there is some good evidence, as I, as I, as I mentioned before, that that difference between the you know most wealthy and the most deprived communities it is actually getting bigger we're not delivering equal improvements in air pollution everywhere and that becomes really really important we also have to think about this in a global sense as well and if you ever look at the maps of air pollution, I mean, everyone's looking at this online. So th there's a really nice uh, project pulled together by a large number of um, sort of NGOs, including the um, Health Effects Institute called the State of Global Air. And it's really worth having a look at that and their most recent reports and in it you'll see maps of global air pollution and you know I, I sit here on the south coast of England and we're not actually doing too badly um, the worst air pollution in the world really focuses on around India China um, you know Pakistan Iran and the whole of that corner of of um, Asia and that's home to somewhere almost half of humanity lives there about 40 nearly 50 percent of humanity lives there so there's huge inequalities these are the most polluted parts of the world and we have most of the people living there so there's huge inequalities that need to be uh, addressed at that level as well um, you are specifically about um, I suppose inequalities um, in maternal outcomes and this is an area it's not really my area of research but I've seen that there are papers appearing in it that are highlighting um, links to sort of birth outcomes and early life development um, back to air pollution exposure and really this comes back to my earlier point about the way we need to be thinking about air pollution as a life course problem so the air pollution that you were exposed to when you know before your birth and as you were growing up may be leading to a lifelong legacy going forward and we that's where the science is is looking at the moment and that means that we need to the evidence that's growing in that arena maybe means that as i think one of the questions uh, alluded to we need to be changing the way that we think about air pollution so not just bringing down air pollution exposure everywhere but also a focus on children and some of the things that have been going on with um, air pollution 
uh, uh, that's been really exciting have been things like the school streets movement. So, so many schools now are actually campaigning just to get the road outside the school closed uh, at drop off times and, and pick up. And this is brilliant. You know, this encourages parents to take their kids to school walking and cycling it gives the kids space to play outside and in this new covid agenda that's before us it's giving people the space to do some physical distancing in that as well and i i think that's really really exciting but yes we need to be investing in air pollution for all communities uh, rosamond you you spoke about the who guidelines and whether we should or should not put them within UK law. But if you look at PM 2.5 concentrations across the UK, some parts of the UK are already meeting these guidelines. So Scotland, parts of Northern England, uh, Wales, parts of Ireland already meet them. So if we were to enshrine WHO guidelines and make that the target, this would only bring about action in the southeast of the country and especially in London. But the health evidence says we need to be bringing down air pollution for all communities. So I think we need to be a lot smarter about the way in which we're setting future targets and future policy. Well, at least that's what the health evidence would tell us. Thanks a lot, Gary. Aruna, um, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Um, I also, I mean, I wanted to, to discuss this idea of uh, half of humanity, um, because within that lie um, extremely different uh, uh, inequities. Now, the thing is, when we look at UN climate debates, the idea of it's, it's convenient to break it up into developing and developed world, but we don't look at issues of caste within there. Now, um, especially since if we're talking about, uh, for instance, most of the mineral resources are located in an indigenous part of the country where you have, again, Dalits as well as Adivasis who have been facing a disproportionate pollution burden. In that historic case, which I spoke about earlier, of a community which challenged Coal India and um, another private firm and won, uh, in terms of the reports that they commissioned, they managed to find that indigenous kids were uh, facing musculoskeletal disorders. Um, you had, again, instances of looking at uh, maternal issues, especially issues of pregnancy uh, around there. And if you're looking at and focusing on COVID, for instance, amongst in the city of Bhopal, which was witness to the worst industrial disaster, um, a disproportionate number of gas tragedy survivors, as well as children and mothers, um, have died because of COVID. Um, and also the health infrastructure is has, has shut the door on them. The kinds of services where they would ordinarily be prioritized, that those are, are now closing on them. So it's the idea of... Um, but then you, you've also got the other part of the, the picture to consider, which is what about uh, the UK may, may be making, uh, cleaning up its extreme, it's, it's a super success story of looking at decarbonizing an electricity system. But what do we talk about exported emissions um, to other countries where most of your manufacturing uh, in terms of uh, like major industrial uh, giants, Vedanta and others, um, who are located in countries like India or in the global south, how are um, how compliant are they with uh, looking at laws or transnational regulations? For instance, India's Environment Ministry says that the WHO guidelines are, uh, I mean, our lungs are basically uh, uh, either four times more resilient than any other lungs in the world. So it's it's different standards. So, I mean, that's, that's um, that we set uh, benchmarks that uh, make, the fact that ours are uh, much more whether resilient or otherwise. There are also questions of who can afford respirators, who can afford air quality filters. It's become a huge market of being able to, to uh, so every winter this happens, everyone tries to sell you a new um, air filter in Delhi or in other cities. Uh, but who can afford to actually afford this? And you've got communities who are hawkers, you've got police, uh, not a huge apologist, but uh, who are out on the streets. Um, you've got 
uh, people who drive auto rickshaws uh, provide the city's transport. Uh, and these are people who are completely left out of the picture. And also the sanitation workers are having to deal with the city's dust, all of that on a daily basis. But um, the country doesn't have health impact assessments as part of law, uh, which it is again a huge variant from uh, looking at UK environment impact assessment and health impact assessments. So it, it's that thing of, of uh, how do we look at especially vulnerable sections of society, those who have been historically marginalized, within them, women, children, the elderly. Uh, and yeah, and how do we make this affordable and accessible? And also looking not just at the UK and as much as we might say net zero plans to kind of get there, uh, also look at the UK's emissions abroad and how do we, and uh, whether they will be held to the same standards that they might be held to right here. Thanks, Aruna. Um, Rosamond, I'm going to come over to you. I think... Sorry, let me just check Sorry, that no, out. I think I was trying to unmute you at the same time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I have to mention the BAME review really don't I and it has caused um, a lot of cause for concern um, because I'm not sure exactly what the stats are whether the BAME community are four times or twice more likely depending on what you read um, I think what struck me though is you're doing a piece of work to find out why the BAME community are adversely affected or why more people are dying from COVID-19 and for some reason unknown to me they left out hair pollution. I don't actually and I've been asked quite a few times why that is. I don't really understand why they did that because I think you know the fact I think what got my interest in the whole issue believe it or not was the bus drivers that were dying and I think when they got to number 17 I, I started to think hmm why are they dying? And the conclusion I came to, and I haven't seen any research on it, and it'll be interesting what Gary thinks about this idea was, is it the fact that they might be driving, I, I don't know how long they've been bus drivers for, but they might have been driving a diesel bus, and does that mean that the uh, immune system has been compromised? Um, but I don't really, I think if you're ser serious about investigating inequality and especially when it's something to do with a respiratory virus then you do need to look at air pollution so to completely leave it out i'm not surprised that they sort of everything has sort of come to a standstill really and i'm not sure whether it's because in the current ap atmosphere whether the government is worried about what the results will show inequality in health structural racism but at least if it's on the table then we can actually discuss it and so now we are in a situation whereby if you're in the BAME the community you're more likely to actually die but you don't actually know why and there are no recommendations for you either so I do hope that they do hurry up with the follow-on but it it did not come to me as a surprise, by the way, the, the fact that more people from the BAME community die from COVID because they are also disproportionately affected by hair pollution. And we, c we have now seen, especially if you look at the Harvard study, there is a relationship between COVID-19 and hair pollution. So I know they actually left it out. Maybe in the second phase, the government might want to add air pollution into the mix as well. Thanks so much, Rosamond. Rosamond. Um, and yeah, really important that we're talking about this, um, especially with everything that's going on. Um, yeah, uh, all these health inequalities, as you say, not a surprise. Um, so I uh, have more, loads and loads of questions. So I'm gonna try and get through as many as we can. Um, and the next one is, sorry, let's get to it. The next one is about indoor air pollution. So it's something that we don't talk about that much, um, but a few people have brought it up. Um, Nathan uh, makes the point that we um, spend so much of our time indoors and during lockdown, this has been even more 
uh, would the panel agree that ventilation competence training for domestic properties must include information on air pollution and clean air technology solutions? Um, and Aaron also says, um, scientists don't know whether all particles of the same size are created equal. For example, is inhaling particles from diesel engines worse than inhaling particles from frying a steak and burning candles in a small kitchen? Um, uh, Aaron says we have to talk more about the indoor outdoor air as well as just overall air quality. Um, does the panel think it's dangerous to divide the two? Um, so thoughts on indoor air pollution basically. Um, I'm, Rune, I'm going to see if you have anything you want to say on that first. I'm sort of kind of um, missing steak and candles though. Um, but that's because I'm a student and need an occasion to celebrate. But I do think that indoor air pollution is, is extremely important to look at because at, depending on energy source, everyone generally keeps going to the clean cook stuff uh, example from India for every energy study. And sometimes some parts, parts of me are like, ah, yes, of course you're going to bring up cook stuffs. But um, I think it's it's also important to consider because what is your source of fuel? Are you are people in areas that are energy rich that are powering up uh, parts of uh, a country being forced to rely on fetching firewood or burning coal uh, to cook on? Or are we looking at how, what about houses with with better ventilation and uh, designing new cities or de designing new infrastructure? I think. Outdoor air pollution gets a lot of um, uh, focus, but also it's, sometimes it it's depends on places because I think uh, the disproportionate amount of literature on cookstoves versus on coal um, uh, can sometimes be seen in terms of, of how that is often portrayed. But I do agree that, that there is a lot more attention on outdoor and I think that's something um, because how do you completely change? It, it's been interesting for me to come in and see UK households where you talk about uh, heating, where you talk about um, insulation and also in terms of pollution control in building codes and that stuff that's put up on the door and your whole safety and other regulations. So it's it's something for, to also kind of take back in terms of how are things designed and is this information that should be made available in terms of ventilation and other things. So I'd be keen to hear from other speakers. But yeah, uh, I agree. We've, we have been raging against one kind of machine for a while. Thanks, Aruna. Um, Rosamond, do you have anything you want to say on this one? Yeah. Um, sorry, Rosamond, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, sorry. There was a study published in January on indoor air and Gary it's not that what you're going to say next is boring I'm going to ru run upstairs and go and get it so that I can show it to everyone and the indoor air actually is actually worse than outdoors but I think the thing with indoor air we can do something about it so during lockdown the fan on our cooker broke and we've got this little machine that measures pm2 so i sort of said to my son who was frying some eggs let's measure the pm whilst um the, the fan isn't working it, it was off the scale that much i can tell you i think we were actually really shocked about that i think there are you know about candles wood burning stoves cooking these are things we can do something about you see whereas outdoor air we feel powerless um so i think as time goes on there will be more and more information like i said a study came out and i will run upstairs and go and get the booklet and show it to everyone um and i feel more hopeful about indoor because i think some of them we can do something about them um it like Haruna said is some of the things we don't like it um, sort of scented candles and things like that these are things that people generally like but unfortunately I think we're going to have to accept what the experts say to us but there is a growing body of 
evidence that actually shows just how bad the indoor air quality is. And I think we need to take it seriously because in future, it seems at least for the next 18 months, we are going to be spending more and more time indoors. I think 90% of our time is now spent indoors. And during lockdown, that went up to 98%. So the air inside the home is going to end up being really, really important. Thanks a lot. And I'm going to hand over to Gary while you run. <laughs> I think um, whoever asked the question um, really asks a massive question here. The first point was about differential toxicity, whether all particles are created equal. I think that was the way it was framed. And this is like one of the real things we'd like to discover about particle pollution. And, you know, particles come from all sorts of different sources and they have different physical and chemical composition. But at the moment, we really don't know which are the ones that are most harmful to us. And if we could understand that better, we could create much more targeted policies. In terms of indoor and outdoor air pollution, there are many, many different perspectives. So I, I said earlier about being called before the GLA assembly and asked about whether there's enough evidence to, that we should be doing something about air pollution. Most of this evidence and huge, huge amounts of it uh, comes from studying outdoor air pollution. And yet, we spend the overwhelming part of our lives indoors, 90, 95% of our time we spend in some sort of indoor environment. Um, but yet there are thousands of studies that says that the outdoor air is affecting our health. So clearly there must be an interaction between the two and the air pollution outside must be affecting our lives inside because that's where we spend most of our time um there are as aruna says there are there are a huge number of people in the world who are having their life shortened because of the way in which they're using solid fuels to cook their food especially across africa and the premature deaths there um amount to millions per year you know almost comparable to the issues of outdoor air pollution. Um, there's a number of ways to think about indoor and outdoor. Um, as I say, there is the outdoor air pollution that comes into your home, and that's been especially important when people are locked down, and you might have seen that many local authorities have been appealing to people not to have uh, bonfires, not to have barbecues, not to use wood-burning stoves, because your next-door neighbour may be indoors as a vulnerable person shielding, and there's nowhere they can go if their house is filled with the smoke from your garden um, or your barbecue. And that's a real problem. And we've all, I think, uh, noticed that. We spend a great deal of our time indoors and people talk about candles, but there are real, there is some important changes going forward in that for many of the pollutants that cause things like ground level ozone, which is a pollutant we don't talk that much about, um, we've controlled these through um, by abating industrial sources across um, Europe and uh, well, at least across Europe and, and North America. And there are some types of pollutant now whereby the indoor environment is the largest source to the outdoor environment. So for instance, the personal care products we use, the inks that are in my printer over there, and the volatile organics that are degassing from us having painted the walls a little while ago and from my sofa. If you add these all together, these are a bigger source of volatile organics to the outdoor environment than industry is now across North America and Europe. So that's another dimension to the need to tackle indoor air pollution. We tackle it not just because we're, it, we should tackle it not just because we're exposed to it, but because it is also for some pollutants becoming a very large source of outdoor um, air pollution. Um, the reason why we don't tackle um, indoor air pollution in the same way as uh, outdoor air pollution simply comes from, uh, I, I, I know it's a sexist cliche, and I suppose I apologize for this, but there's the whole idea of the Englishman's home is their castle. And you 
government does not tread on the things that you do indoors. And therefore, it is very difficult. Aruna, you talked about burning candles, yeah? So suppose I went and made a law that actually said, thou shall not burn candles inside your home. Otherwise, you'll get a fixed penalty notice of £25 or £50 if you don't pay within four weeks. It's going to be really difficult to do. Um, we need to be doing a lot more about the materials that we buy to use in our homes. And there's a real onus here on the manufacturers of these materials. Because at the moment, if you look at, um, I've got my daughter, I've got some nail varnish over here, for instance, oh, from family member having been applying this in the lounge. Um, this contains a lot of volatile organics. And the people that manufacture it, only manufacture it and then deliver it. They're not responsible for the onward emission of the volatile organics in here to the air. So there needs to be a lot more accountability in the people that manufacture products for their end use. And our legal structures uh, do not have that at the moment. So indoor air pollution, massive, massive topic, uh, which I think is underexplored. And um, I think from a leg legislative perspective, it's actually really quite difficult. Thanks, Gary. Maybe we need to do another magazine just on indoor air pollution. Rosamond, I'm going to let you uh, quickly wave that thing. <coughs> <laughs> there you go. So that's the study that Rosamond was talking about. Um, so I'm going to ask another question now. Um, we've got so many, so I'm really sorry that we're not going to be able to go through them all. Um, it's quite a big picture question from Nick, um, who asks, we have privatised water, without which we would all die, um, as in water, uh, we, sorry, start again, we would all die without water, but we have privatised water um, in many places. Um, do the panel imagine a similar solution for clean air that preserves the rich or those that can access it while sacrificing others? So potentially a little bit dystopian, but um, I'd love to hear what you've all got to say on that. Um, uh, Rosamond, do you have any thoughts on that? Goodness. Hopefully, <laughs> look, I believe clean air is a human right and everybody everywhere deserves um, to breathe clean air. Um, God, I hope it doesn't get to that stage. Rather an interesting sort of um, scenario. Well, one of the reasons why I'm fighting for what I'm doing is so that everybody everywhere can breathe um, clean air. So I hope it doesn't go down the same um, path as water. I do accept that um, there are places in the world, much to my horror, I found this out from doing my role at WHO, that still don't have clean, clean water. And that's something in the West we tend to take for granted. So I hope not. I know there are inequalities but I hope soon in time we can all breathe clean air. Um, I must add on to that. What I have noticed, though, in campaigning for this, areas where people are poor or they have much more pressing needs, you see, and I, and I always stress to people, it's not that people who are adversely affected don't care about this topic. It's just that they have many more other things to worry about and they do need other people to fight on for them really. They don't have the time to take off work, to go to parliament and things like that. So they need everyone to fight on their behalf. But I hope, <laughs> I hope in future that all of us can breathe clean air. And I do believe it is fundamentally a human right. Thanks a lot, Rosamond. Uh, Aruna, um, do you have any thoughts on this question? I think uh, we're already there. And as I described on the last question, in, you've got um, air filters, highest tech. The, the Prime Minister's office ordered a whole bunch of cutting edge, top of the line um, uh, air filters for, again, looking at the government. Um, this, while our own environment ministry says that there's no conclusive uh, connection between uh, mortality and air pollution. 
So on one level, you're denialist. On the other, you want top of the line um, equipment to insulate um, you. So the idea that of, of air being the great leveler uh, is and is no longer is not a myth that we can subscribe to. I think the we already have Elysiums of. Uh, Looking in these gated communities and colonies that have their own green belt or that are, that um, are located in greener parts of the city, and you dump people in industrial ghettos. So I think we're already very much in uh, those dystopias, and seeing the inequalities in that is is extremely evident. Who lives near a landfill? Who has to deal with waste? Who has to uh, deal with? Uh, the fallout of pollution of industry. So all of that is, and but I think also very importantly is access to healthcare. Now, if you're looking at who gets, if you, the NHS is still stands out, but if you, but of course, like the disproportionate impact on people of color and also doctors of color is something that needs to be registered. But in places where you do not have strong public healthcare, and it is for you to be able to get a COVID test, um, is is something that would cost you more than a couple of months' salary uh, back home, and for you to be able to get it by going to a government hospital is nearly impossible. Um, so, for, for to to know or to have this being treated, so many mining areas that people you you could have the richest, uh, uh, like somebody who's an oil and gas giant who can fly down Beyonce, but in their area they might have a public hospital where. Um, you are never told that you have tuberculosis, or you might be told that you have uh, bronchitis. Uh, but these are never conclusive. You can be kept running around in circles or never given a job in the company saying that you have poor lungs. So I think we, we, we are seeing this, but how do we get to a state where it is, as we're talking about, um, clean air is a human right, and um, that we can challenge these uh, systemic uh, injustices because we are already sort of that way in terms of rich neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, um, and uh, the increasing bubble privatization. You have extremely fancy masks that you can buy in the Delhi airport um, that have nice logos on it. They're called VOG masks. So, yeah, I, uh, let's hope that we're not all forced to model them in these uh, strange times. Thanks a lot, Aruna. Gary, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, question um, to draw parallels between uh, water and air. Um, I remember being struck by my daughter when she was at primary school coming home from one of her science lessons saying, you know, daddy, daddy, we, we've learned at school today that you can go for um, around three weeks without food, around three days without water. Uh, sorry, three Three, yeah, three days without water, but only around three minutes without air. Therefore, air must be the most important thing. And I thought to myself, yeah, you're right, but I'm not sure it is that way. Um, you know, in, in the UK, we have good, clean tap water. If the stuff that was coming out of taps was was killing, what, nine and a half thousand people in London or somewhere between about 27, maybe 60,000 people per year, so nine and a half thousand per year in London, 27, 28 to about 60,000 people per year in the UK, um, then there would be complete outcry. Um, and so there should be, you know, someone will be held accountable, but we don't see our air in the same way. What we see our air, not really as an essential thing for life, but we see air as a waste disposal mechanism. Probably from the first time that humanity sat around a fire, they noticed the way that the wind carried the smoke away somewhere else. And it became a, you know, we just use the air as a waste disposal mechanism. It carries pollution away from where it's created to where it becomes someone else's problem. And the people that do the pollution are not necessarily accountable for it once the air has moved it away. And this is a real problem. And Aruna, you, you talk about the situation whereby people that have wealth and access can 
buy of air filtration devices for their home. And we're seeing this across, well, China especially, it's, it's a huge marketplace, but yeah, for the wealthier people in India and, and elsewhere. And really that is not the solution. And I think that's almost dangerously so. So if the people that have um, more disproportionate amount of power in our society already have their own privatized solution to this problem, then there will be even less pressure to sort it out for um, everyone. And it's not just an environmental justice perspective from uh, the people that are effective. It's, uh, there is a real fundamental principle here that the polluter should pay. So it's the onus on uh, the people that are creating the pollution to ensure that they're not using the air, which is a common resource, as a waste disposal mechanism. And that's really where the emphasis should be. It should not be on you know, me as a wealthy individual to go and buy uh, a filtration system for my home, whereas my neighbor can't afford one, and that doesn't matter. It should be the responsibility of the polluter not to uh, create the problem in the first place. Thanks, Gary. So I think that is pretty much all we have time for, which I'm pretty gutted about because we have so many good questions. Um, but um, just to say thank you so much to everyone who's come um, and to all of our speakers. We've had about 55 people joining us today from the UK, Germany, India, New Zealand, and I'm sure other places. Um, so thanks very much for coming. So we've heard from Rosamond Kissy Deborah um, from the Ella Roberta Family Foundation and many other things. Um, Gary Fuller of King's College London and journalist Aruna Chandrasekhar. And um, please do check out the Ella Roberta Family Foundation and donate if you can. And also check out Gary's book, which is out on Melville House UK. And all of Aruna's work is on her website. Uh, and you'll see some links in the chat for all of those things. You can find out more about New Internationalist at newint.org. Uh, and uh, just to remind you that we um, will be doing a short survey at the end. So it'd be really great if you could fill it in uh, and uh, you might get a free subscription. To, we probably will get a free subscription to New Internationalist. Um, and we also have a limited number of free subscriptions to give away to community organisers, activists, state schools and community groups in England. So if you know anyone uh, and you'd like to nominate them, then do just get in touch with us. I'm going to leave the chat open for another five minutes um, before I completely close the webinar. So after we've gone, you'll still be able to take down the chat because I know everyone's been chatting away there. Um, and if you need to know how to do that, you just click on the three little dots that are at the bottom of the chat next to where it says file and then just click save chat and you'll be able to save all the links and everything. So yeah, thank you once more to everyone and thanks uh, to all of our speakers. Um, and if we were in a real life room, I'm sure there'd be a big clap right now, but we're all clapping at home. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody.